Welcome to Tyler Madero's TV. Make sure you get comfortable because in today's video, we're going to be getting into the strangest last meal requests on death row. This first person we're going to be talking about is a man from New York City named Joseph Mitchell Parsons, born July 22nd, 1964. Joseph was also known as Yogi to the ones who were close to him. For the first five years of Joseph's life, it was just him and his mother due to his father being incarcerated. His parents would make a living working odd jobs until his father left the family. At that point, Joseph's mother, Mary Parsons, took him and his half-sister named Dina to Florida, where Mary Parsons would meet a drug dealer that went by the name Yogi. Joseph admired Yogi so much, he adopted the name and would even get a tattoo of it. After only one year in Florida, Joseph was caught stealing money from a management office in an apartment building. Joseph would go on to get three burglary convictions in only four years while he was in Florida as a minor. Joseph also had an interest in motorcycles, and when his stepfather refused to buy him one, he went and test drove a motorcycle from a Fort Lauderdale dealership and never returned. Joseph took the motorcycle to see his biological father in New Jersey, but had no success. He then decided he would ride the motorcycle to Las Vegas, Nevada. There, Joseph would meet a man named David Wood, and together they would take a cab to the Strip. As they approached the destination, Parsons pointed a gun at the driver and attempted to rob him, stealing his taxi. Just minutes down the road, they were arrested in an alley under citizen's arrest. During the trial, Parsons stated he was an orphan and never got in trouble and even testified against David Wood. Parsons would later state that he made a false testimony for a lighter sentence. David Wood was sentenced to 13 years in prison. After Joseph serving five years in prison, he was paroled in August 1987 to a halfway house in Reno. But before his release date, Parsons got out of the facility and took off on a stolen motorcycle. It was August 30th, 1987, when Joseph Parson would make the worst decision of his life. He was picked up while hitchhiking by a man named Richard Lynn Ernest. Ernest was on his way to Denver, Colorado for a construction job. Ernest wasn't aware that Parsons was a fugitive on the run. And at about 3 a.m., Ernest decided to pull over at a rest stop area because he was too tired to drive. Parson then decided to stab Ernest and take his vehicle. At around 5 a.m., only 23 miles away from the crime scene, Parsons pulled into a service station wearing Ernest's clothing. Officials say that Parson had taken Ernest's identity due to statements from the witnesses. Parson told the clerk that he needed to wash out red paint from a construction job and even offered to give the clerk Ernest's tools that were in the vehicle. Parson even went as far as mentioning a nine-year-old son just like Ernest had. Witnesses recall seeing Parson throwing away clothing, books, and tools in a nearby dumpster. Before leaving, Parson used Ernest's credit card to buy cigarettes and some food. A couple hours later at 7.23 a.m., Parson used the credit card once again in Utah to check in to a quality inn. Parson would then go on to use the card a few more times. At 10 a.m., he purchased seat covers and floor mats in the attempt to cover up the bloodstains in the vehicle. The next time Parson went to use the card, it was declined due to being over its limit. Back at the service station, the clerk found Parson's activities strange and went to investigate the dumpster where he would find bloody items. The clerk then contacted the Beaver County Sheriff's Office. Officials investigated the dumpster and found Parsons' bloody clothes along with Ernest's bank statements. 
Officials then contacted Ernest's wife to confirm the identity of Ernest, in which they came to the conclusion that the man who visited the service station was in fact not Richard Ernest. On August 31st, around 4.25 p.m., a highway patrol unit came across Parson sleeping in Ernest's vehicle in a rest stop. When officials brought Parson to the station where the bloody clothes were, he continued to insist that he was Richard Ernest. It was when they asked him for his street address, Parson then asked for a lawyer. On September 1st, Richard Ernest was found underneath a sleeping bag dumped on Interstate 15, just a mile north of the rest area where he had been murdered. On September 19th, during a court hearing, Parson pled guilty to auto theft, aggravated robbery, and first-degree murder, stating, why are we doing this? I did it, and everyone knows it. He also stated that Ernest made a pass at him, and he was only defending himself. But Parson failed to provide any evidence supporting his statement. Examiners stated that the evidence pointed to Ernest being stabbed while he was asleep, causing him not to be able to defend himself. In 1990, on March 5th, Parson was sentenced to execution by lethal injection. Parson would then appeal it due to having counsel that was ineffective throughout the trial, in which a new team of attorneys would pick up the appeal. In 1994, on January 12th, Parson's petition for an unlawful imprisonment would be rejected by the Supreme Court. The last visit Parson had was his mother in 1996, where they spent two hours together. On July 6, 1999, Parson dropped his appeal and stated he would rather be executed than spend years waiting on death row, stating that it was torture, plain and simple. By August, the district judge signed the death warrant for the execution of Joseph Parson. On August 15th, Leading up to his execution, he would request to walk under the stars, play basketball, and watch science fiction movies. He also requested that he be cremated and his ashes given to his family. The evening before his execution, Parson was granted a last meal, where he would watch The Mummy and enjoy his meal of Burger King hamburgers, french fries, milkshakes, root beer, and chocolate chip ice cream in which he would share with his brother and cousin who came to visit him one last time. On October 15th, 1999, at 12.10 a.m., Joseph Parson was executed by lethal injection. Next, we're going to be getting into the infamous Theodore Robert Bundy, born November 24th, 1946, in Burlington, Vermont. For the first three years of Ted Bundy's life, he would actually spend living with his grandparents in Philadelphia to avoid the stigma of his mother birthing a baby out of wedlock. Ted and everyone around his family were made to believe that Ted was their child and his real mother was his older sister. Now Ted's father wasn't in his life and he didn't actually know who his father was. But in 1950, Ted's mom, Eleanor Louise Cowell, left Philadelphia with Ted and changed her surname to Nelson to go live with cousins in Tacoma, Washington. One year later, Eleanor met a hospital cook named Johnny Culpepper Bundy. Later that same year, Eleanor and Johnny Bundy got married and Johnny decided to officially adopt Ted. Johnny and Eleanor would then go on to have four kids together which made Ted grow distant and not fond of Johnny. Bundy would graduate high school in 1965 and go on to attend multiple universities in a span of three years, where he got romantically involved with a classmate named Stephanie Brooks. In 1968, Bundy dropped out of school and would go on to work minimum wage jobs. He also volunteered during Nelson Rockefeller's presidential campaign and became Arthur Fletcher's bodyguard and driver for his campaign for Lieutenant Governor of Washington. In 1968, Stephanie Brooks and Ted Bundy would end their relationship and Brooks would travel back home to California. Ted was devastated with the ending of his and Brooks' relationship, so he made his way to Colorado, Arkansas, and Philadelphia to visit relatives. 
Ted would even enroll himself into Temple University for one semester. It was in 1969 that they believed Ted got a hold of his birth records from the Office of Birth Records in Burlington. By the fall of 1969, Bundy was back in Washington, and that's when he would meet Elizabeth Klopfer, a divorce secretary from Utah who now worked at the University of Washington School of Medicine. Her and Bundy would go on to have a very serious relationship. Mid-1970, Bundy enrolled himself once again in the University of Washington to major in psychology. Bundy was top of his class while attending the university and was well liked by the professors. Bundy went on to graduate from the University of Washington in 1972. In early 1973, Bundy would get accepted into a law school due to great recommendations. In 1973, during a trip to California, Stephanie Brooks and Bundy crossed paths and began to explore their love once again. All while Bundy still being in a serious relationship with Elizabeth Klopfer. And neither of the women were aware of the situation. But in January 1974, Bundy would cut all communication with Brooks. August of that year, Bundy would get accepted to a law school in Salt Lake City. While Stephanie Klopfer stayed in Seattle, even though her and Bundy spoke often, Bundy dated multiple women during his time there. Just over a month of Bundy being in Utah, a string of homicides began occurring. In August of 1975, Bundy was arrested in Utah by the highway patrol when the officer noticed the Volkswagen bug picking up speed once he noticed the cruiser. When the officer pulled Bundy over, he noticed the passenger seat had been removed from its position and was laying in the back of the car. He also found an array of objects, from ski masks to a crowbar, handcuffs, and trash bags with a coil of rope, and an ice pick along with other items. Bundy tried telling the officer that he had the ski mask from skiing, and one day he had just come across the handcuffs in a dumpster, and the rest of the objects were just items from around the house. It didn't help Bundy's case that in 1974, Elizabeth Klopfers had called in a tip that Bundy could possibly be a suspect in the string of homicides. The officer remembered the description of the suspect and the description of the car, resulting to the arrest of Bundy. But the police didn't have enough evidence to detain him. At that point, officials began watching Bundy's every move. Detectives even went as far as to fly to Seattle to speak with Elizabeth, where she would say she would discover objects that she just couldn't explain. One of the objects being a meat cleaver, which was never used for cooking, a bag of women's clothing, and a knife that was in a wooden box that Bundy would keep in his car glove compartment. After further investigating, officials learned that Bundy wasn't with Elizabeth on any of the nights the crimes happened, which now made him the prime suspect. Shortly after, Elizabeth was interviewed again, and at that point, she found out about Bundy's relationship with Stephanie Brooks while they were seeing each other. Bundy would end up selling his Volkswagen Beetle to a teenager where the FBI would end up impounding the car to search it for evidence. After searching the vehicle, officials found evidence of the victims being in the car at one point in time. It was on October 2nd that Ted Bundy was placed into a lineup where he would end up being picked out. Bundy was charged with aggravated kidnapping and attempted criminal assault, but was let out on $15,000 bail. During the time of the trial, Bundy was staying with Elizabeth in Seattle. February of 1976, Bundy was found guilty and sentenced to 15 years in prison. He was then caught in October hiding in the bushes of the prison with maps, flight times, and a social security card. In 1977, Bundy was transported on June 7th to a prison in Aspen, where he would then decide to represent himself, which would excuse him from wearing handcuffs and shackles. During a hearing recess, Bundy requested permission to go to the law library so he could further prepare for his case. While Bundy was in the library, he opened the window and jumped two stories down to the ground and took off. Bundy was able to walk right through roadblocks just by a simple change to his clothing. Six days later, 
Bundy would get caught when police pulled him over because they noticed the car swerving on the road. Bundy would then go on to plan another escape from inside his cell, using a hacksaw to cut into the ceiling of his cell so he could gain access to a small crawl space which would lead him to the chief correctional officer's apartment in the prison, where Bundy would then change his clothes and walk right out of the front doors of the prison. Moments later, Bundy stole a car and began to drive eastbound with $500 he had smuggled in throughout the span of six months. Soon after, the car would end up breaking down, and someone who was driving by ended up giving Bundy a ride to where Bundy would then get on a bus and travel to Denver. He would then get on a flight to Chicago. It wasn't until 17 hours later that they noticed Bundy was gone, and by that time, he was already in Chicago. On February 15th, Bundy was stopped by police due to the car he was driving being reported as stolen. But before he was able to be put under arrest, Bundy attacked the officer and began to run. The officer let off a couple warning shots and then was able to tackle Bundy to the ground. Upon arresting Bundy, the officer had no idea that he had just arrested one of the FBI's most wanted criminals. On their drive to the station, Bundy would tell the officer he wished the officer would have just killed him. Bundy would go on to stand multiple trials for various cases which would result in him being found guilty of his crimes and sentenced to death by execution. Throughout the years 1974 and 1978, Bundy killed more than 30 women. No one truly knows the actual number, but it's suspected to be even more. On January 24th, 1989, Ted Bundy was executed by electric chair. But before Bundy's execution, he was granted a last meal, which Bundy didn't make any specific request and was fed the normal last meal of steak, eggs, toast with butter and jam, along with hash browns, coffee, and juice. Bundy did not have a single bite of the meal. The last person we're going to be getting into is a man named Thomas J. Grasso, born November 23rd, 1962. It was in 1990 on December 24th that Grasso would murder an 87 year old woman in Tulsa, Oklahoma. Before he stole $8 from her purse and gathered about $4 in loose change, Grasso would even steal her television, which he would end up selling for $125. Just six months after the crime, Grasso moved to New York with his wife, where on July 4th of 1991, he would murder an 81-year-old man from Staten Island. Officials were able to arrest Grasso due to evidence found at the scene, and two weeks later, Grasso would confess about both the murders he had committed, which would ultimately lead to his execution on March 20th, 1995. Three hours before he was set to be executed, Grasso released a statement in the form of a poem, reading, Ready, willing, and waiting I am. Asked for death, but could not die. Each sunrise is one day less. I'll endure this horrible mess. When the last sun does sink, Mr. E will serve a goodbye drink. On the day our paths do cross, it won't take much to see it through. Just a little toxic brew. The warden will read my last creed and the deadly brew will flow as the poison drips into my veins and from my body, life does drain. I'll know then once and for all what last call means when serving Toxol. Before Grassel's execution, his request for a last meal was two dozen steamed mussels, two dozen steamed clams, a double cheeseburger from Burger King, a half dozen barbecued ribs, two strawberry milkshakes, half of a pumpkin pie with whipped cream, diced strawberries, and spaghettios with meatballs. Just minutes before Grassel's execution, he released one final statement to the press, saying, I did not get my SpaghettiOs. I got spaghetti. I want the press to know this. 
Now I want to know what you guys think down below in the comments, and if you guys had to choose one last meal, what would it be? Now I'm going to go ahead and close out today's video here. I hope you guys really enjoyed it. If you did, give it a nice big thumbs up. I really do appreciate it. I want to thank you guys so much for all the love and support that you guys continuously give me. It means the world to me, and I will see you guys in my next video. Peace.